Hi, I'm Ray, G4NSJ. Many years ago, I bought a Mini Whip Active Antenna. There it is, and there's the box you get with it. it says they're 10 kilohertz to 30 megahertz. Right, amazing little thing. I wouldn't be without it, I use it every day. This is a spare one. This is a bias T box. Now you've got to get 12 volts into here to work the gubbins in there, the electronics, right? You've got to get 12 volts in there. There's two ways of doing it. You either run a cable separate from the coax into there to supply the little thing with its 12 volts, or you can shove the 12 volts up the coax to this. Now that's the way it's done. In fact, this is nothing new. Back in the 1960s, when I worked in the radio and TV workshop, we had mast head amplifiers. You get a weak signal area Okay, you've got up on your chimney, your aerial, your TV aerial, the coax will go into a little box, just like that really, masthead amplifier. So you amplify the signal as soon as it comes out of the aerial, and then you pump that down the coax to the television. On the back of the telly was a little box with a switch on it, turn it on and off, and a PP3 battery in there. And the coax from the telly goes in there, coax up to the aerial goes there. And it was a little bias tea box. Inside was a little choke and whatever bits and pieces. And that sent the PP3 9 volts up the coax to the masthead amplifier up the top on the chimney there. The reason you didn't have the amplifier down at the TV end is because if it's a weak signal, by the time it's come down the coax, it's going to be even weaker. And all the amplifier would do is amplify the noise. So you have it up by the aerial. Now the thing is, you've got to get 12 volts into that, as I said, you can shove it up the coax, which is the best way, because that way you've just got the one cable. That happens in here. That goes to the, there we are, that goes to the aerial, your antenna. That goes to your receiver. Then in there you put 12 volts as a ground connection, which you must have with this to improve signals. So how do you get the 12 volts into the coax? and out of the coax again this end without attenuating your RF signal or degrading it in any way. That all happens on this little bias T board. Now this is the original one I had and I got water, somehow water got into the box where this was housed and it wrecked it as you can see it's all gone horrible and the thing just wrecked itself. Okay time for the blackboard. This is an RF choke Right, that's the capacitor. This is the coax. I've only drawn the inner, I'm not going to draw the outer as well. This is the coax. This goes to your receiver, this goes to the antenna up the pole through the coax. Put 12 volts in there through an RF choke. What an RF choke does, it will allow DC to flow through it, all right, but it won't allow RF to flow through it. So what you're doing, you're putting 12 volts into the inner of the coax there, up to the aerial. The RF here, the weak RF signal coming to your receiver, won't go down there. This won't pass it. That blocks RF but allows DC to flow through. The capacitor here, this allows RF to go to your receiver, but it blocks DC. Okay, this is a very basic circuit. Some of these uh, bias T units are quite complicated. They've got different inductors and stuff everywhere. This is the basic way it operates. So your RF signal comes along here, straight through the capacitor to your receiver. 12 volts goes here to the inner, up to the aerial. And of course the aerial end, you've got a similar arrangement sort of in reverse. That blocks DC, you've got 12 volts DC here, positive. You don't like going to your receiver, all right? That'll muck things up on the receiver end. So that is basically a bias T. It's called a bias T because it's a T shape. There we are. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Just one last thing. The outer of the coax, okay, the braid. This is the braid here. That just goes straight through. as the outer of the coax. The 12 volts negative, uh, negative, goes to the braid. So you've got 12 volts negative on the braid, the braid there, the braid there, that's just all one grounded thing, all right? So the bias T was waterlogged, as I said, the little board, so I've got another one. There's a picture of it, slightly different, that's got a, an inductor in the middle there, a larger inductor, 
but it's still not very big. Anyway, it worked all right. It was it was reasonable. It worked until that one went wrong. And then I thought I'm going to have to perhaps have a go at making my own. So what I did, going back to the blackboard idea there, I just took random components out of my box. OK, I've got all drawers of RF chokes, capacitors, you name it. An RF choke. I just took any old RF choke. There's a little selection of them there, look. And I took a smallish one just to see what happened. I had no idea of the value of it. And I stuck it on a bit of Vera board. There it is. And I bodged a couple of SMA sockets each end. I've now ordered um, edge connector type SMA sockets. They should be here soon. This was a temporary sort of prototype lash up. So I stuck my RF choke on there as per the diagram on the blackboard. I've got a box of well, loads of capacitors. I found a ceramic capacitor, 2500 puff. What's that in nano uh, Farad? What is it? I don't know, 2.5 is it? Whatever it is. I'm old school, yeah, you know that, don't you? I'm old school, 2500 pico Farad. It doesn't matter. I didn't bother about the value. I just grabbed it out of the box and that's what it happened to be. And I chucked it all together on that board and it worked extremely well. I've just looked that up. It is two and a half thousand puff. 2,500 picofarad is 2.5 nanofarad. You'll know that I'm old school. I talk about killer cycles, don't I? You know, like 1,500 KCs and stuff instead of kilohertz. I can't help it. Anyway, that's the way it is. Now, the thing is, it worked. I tried it on my low HF150 receiver because the, the aerial... Uh, all comes into here and I've got a little switch box there for all these receivers so I thought I'd try it on the low HF150 this is my new lash up bias T board with the RF choke and it was absolutely amazing in fact it was better than the original one that I got with this and with the replacement that I got it's better than both of those and I'm thinking this is interesting why does it work so well? Am I just lucky with the choice of components? Oh, if you want to know, uh, yeah, that's the capacitor. The RF choke was five millihenries. I measured it on my meter, five millihenries. And uh, what was it? 2.5 nanofarad. If you want to do exactly what I've done, it worked really well. And I couldn't believe how well it worked because online I've looked up bias T calculators. Now you have the impedance in and out of here you want 50 ohms because that's normally what the stuff is 50 ohm coax and i thought well i haven't worked that out at all i don't know what impedance this is now with my bodge up in there and it says you know put in your 50 ohms put in your frequency you want and all this i thought frequency well i don't want one frequency i want the whole you know from vnf down long wave end right up to 30 megs i'm not bothered about more than 30 megs up there i'm not worried about that I want the whole of the HF and everything. So I thought, well, I'm not going to bother with all this uh, online calculator. Let's just try this. I then got hold of this. See that one? Now that has got a, a decent inductor on it. And it says on the advert, because I bought this, it says on the advert, 200 kilohertz, <laughs> kilocycles, okay, 200 kilohertz to 180 megahertz. So I thought, well, that, that would be what I want. That's, that's good for what I want. So I bought it. The ones that you get here, they're advertised as 10 meg to whatever, 6 gig, some of them. I don't see how 6 gig's not going to go through that. You lose too much. Anyway, 10 megs. I thought, well, why 10 megs? Because I want below 10 megs. I want the, the other half of the HF spectrum, medium wave, AM band, long wave, VLF, right down there. And I was a bit worried why it said 10 megs. They all say 10 megs, except this one I found. There it is again. 200 kilohertz, 280 megs. So I stuck that in the box. Now that one was as good as my homemade one, okay? Except for down VLF. My homemade one was really good on the, you know, the non-directional beacons between or what was long or medium wave, you know, like between, what is it, 300 and say 450 kilohertz in there. The beacons were very good on my homemade one. 
and they weren't bad on the, the new one I just bought with the ferrite ring and the inductor. The one I bought was a little bit better up 25 megs up to 30 megs end. It was a little bit better than mine, but only because mine had some sort of instability. I, it was introducing a kind of all that sort of stuff. I don't know what that was. I was listening to uh, 21630. 21.630 megs to the BBC relay station on the Ascension Island and uh, that's 21630 kilohertz. They transmit to uh, Africa isn't it and South America I believe. Listen to that on here and my homemade one introduced a little bit of this weird whistly sound. It probably just wants decoupling or something like that. I'm going to look into that. So the one with the adapter, that one there again just to remind you, that worked almost as well as well as mine, but not quite, to be honest, especially down VLF end. I'm just coming back to the blackboard again, just to show you something about this RF choke. That's the RF choke there, and that's the capacitor. Okay, nothing to do with the bias T. This is a transmitter. Let's say that's an 807 in a 19 set. Who remembers a 19 set on Echo Charlie? I didn't say that. Right, HT to the valve. The anode here, want 600 volts, all right? So you put 600 volts through an RF choke. Why through an RF choke? Well, if you remember, that will pass DC, but not RF. This produces RF here. So you've got RF coming out the anode. You don't want it going back up into the HT supply. It would just wreck everything. So that's no good. You've got to have your RF choke. DC flows through it, RF doesn't. This goes to your Pi tank circuit or whatever you, arrangement you've got and to your aerial. All right, there's your aerial. This here lets RF through, same with the bias T if you remember, but it blocks DC. So you've got your 600 volts on your anode. If you don't have that, it'll work without that. Short that out, it'll work. But you've got 600 volts HT on your aerial. And if someone's out in the garden, well, what's this wire? Psst. Okay, so you must have your the capacitor in there to keep the DC off. Now, the reason I decided to try this RF choke, this is exactly the one that I've used. You, you would use it here. It's the same type. I thought, well, hang on a minute. These transmitters, when we used to build transmitters in the old days, and when we used to use them on medium wave and all sorts of naughty things, an RF choke here worked fine, whether it be medium wave, 6.6 uh, .6 megs, 40 meters, 10 meters, whatever band we used, this was fine, the same RF choke. So I thought, well, if that blocks RF over the entire sort of spectrum, up to 30 megs, it's got to be good for the bias T. That's why I decided to try one. No doubt some of you will be saying, well, you know, you should do it properly, you should work out values and all that. I'm not into mathematics, I can't do all that. And anyway, why should I? It works. My homemade one works better than, first of all, the original that I bought with the with that. It works better than that. Also, the inductor, you look on the board, the inductor's a tiny thing. I mean, how could that be any good at all? I don't know, it can't be, can it? I mean, it works, but how well? What I should do, I know, because someone's going to email and say, oh, you should measure it all properly. Get the test gear. Have you, you know, put your input, put your output, have your 12 volts, work out the loss and all this, blah, blah, blah. Do a graph, you know, of whatever. I can't be bothered to do all that. I'm too old for, you do that if you want. That's an idea, that'll keep you busy. There we are, it's January. It's not very nice weather here in the Northern Hemisphere. Something to do in the winter evening. Work all that out, let me know, and then I can tell everyone about it. As far as I'm concerned, my homebrew one, which was bits out of the junk box, so to speak, works every bit as well as ones that you buy and you don't have to oh that picture look that picture there you don't have to have SMA sockets each end like I've done I only did that so I can plug it in and unplug it while I'm doing various tests on it you can just take the coax from your little board in there just to each of these you, know, you don't you don't have to have the SMA things Anyway, has that been useful to you? Has that been any help? Probably not. <laughs> if you want to have a look at my website, it's g4nsj.co.uk. Go to the website, g4nsj.co.uk.
www.bias.co.uk go to the main menu and you can look down you'll find bias t there and something and you find this one the little ats 20 plus receiver i i did a video on that didn't i was it last week you'll find all sorts of stuff there that you may or may not find interesting thanks for watching as always i shall see you next time bye bye for now